Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Bob Dockler, and I'm the accreditation manager at the police department. Um, and to my right is Brittany Hildebrandt. She's one of our public information officers, and she's going to be monitoring our email account that we have set up for policies to see if anybody is responding through questions. Um, a few housekeeping uh, things, I guess, is they have this set up tonight to be recorded so that people can review this um, after the fact and send in any questions or, or participate in that way if they don't feel comfortable or can't be here in live uh, person for the meeting. Um, I think from what I understand due to the recording is if you have questions or things that you would like to discuss about a certain policy, um, go ahead and approach the podium and uh, that way it's being recorded both visually and, and in audio, from what I understand. Come on in, Chief. Doing well, how are you? Come on up. Um, I don't know, being recorded, if introductions are, uh, are appropriate. If you feel comfortable telling me who you are and telling us who you are, Feel free to do so. Um, if you don't, I understand that as well. This is Chief Jones. Hey, Jeff Jones. Okay. Well, um, it has been, due to all kinds of different circumstances, it's been quite a while since we've had one of these meetings. Um, but that does not mean that progress has not been uh, moving forward as far as our accreditation process or our revision of our policies. So I have a, uh, I hope it's not too challenging, challenging of an agenda tonight. I've got 11 policies that I would like to go through um, in hopes that we got them out, I think what, two weeks ago, Brittany? In hopes that everybody would have an opportunity to review them and, and come prepared with any questions that you might have. Um, I don't think anybody wants to, to sit there and listen to me read the policies, so um, I won't bore you and, and put you through that. So I've got these in numerical order, starting with uh, policy 208, which is our training policy. Uh, this is a policy that back in January of 2020, we did an extensive revision to it already. Um, but, at, but as I go through the CALEA standards, and there's 180 something of them, I in, inadvertently come across something that trickles back down and, and has to be addressed in other areas. So the main change to this, the most recent revision, was to include uh, standard 22.1.9, which de deals with uh, refresher and reintegration training. So back in March, we uh, developed a, a specific policy to provide us guidance for our personnel that take military leave and go off and serve our country. And oftentimes they are gone for quite a while. When they come back, we have to have a system um, to reintegrate them to make sure that they are up on all of their training to make sure that if there is any post-certified uh, requirements that they missed to keep their certification, that we get them caught up on that, and also to put them through a field training program to basically get them comfortable doing their job again. Um, you know, it's something that once you uh, get out of it for a while, uh, you need a little bit of time to get back in and, and, uh, and do the job. So the main changes to this policy were to account for the reintegration training and I'm going to skip all the way down to areas that we added. We thought the best place to put this was in our field training program. I promise you it's in here somewhere. Here we go. So we added that the field training program may also be used and modified for the following training needs. We also needed to address remedial training, refresher and reintegration training, um, as I described earlier. There, there are other instances where someone might be away other than military. They could be on FMLA leave or 
in a specialty unit assignment um, for quite a while where they're not on patrol, extended injury leave, military deployment, and basically any, any other type of absence. One of the th systems we put into place and, and an accountability measure um, was anybody who goes on this type of leave will be assigned to our training and recruiting unit. There will be a folder that is uh, uh, developed specifically for that employee and they are responsible for keeping track of everything that that employee has missed out on in their absence. And then when they come back, they're assigned to TRU uh, they go through an interview with the chief or, chief or his designee, and we get them back into the saddle. So, any questions on this policy? Yes, yes. If I could ask you to go to the to the microphone, I know it's it's going to be tough on us all. This is, yeah, just for fairness, so everybody can hear Sorry. what your question was. Uh, the name is Sean, by the way, and I was asking um, when it comes to the um, the reintegration for um, our military service people coming back into the force. Was there an aspect of mental health? Yes, and the answer to your question is yes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when they first come back, one of the first things that happens is that they have a sit down uh, with the chief of police and also our assistant to the chief. Um, and she has a, basically they set up a meeting with TRU, the chief. Training and recruiting unit. Yeah, I'm sorry, training and recruiting unit. And one of the very first things they want to know in that interview is basically is there anything that you are struggling with that we need to know about and that's an opportunity for us to provide them information for EAP. Um, one of the other things we're going to go through tonight is um, the uh, implementation of our critical incident response team or a peer support group. Um, we also have chaplains available um, to the police department that are part of our department. So we have several different avenues that we can direct them towards resources if they need it. Great. Thank you. You bet. Sure, thank you, Tony. Any other questions on this policy? Hi, my name's Chad. Uh, just, I had a question concerning, um, and this might be on the scope of this particular meeting, but what are the policies or what actually informs what you're training on to do what? I'm not sure I understand your question, Chad. Okay, so for example, like, you know, your patrolling practices, I assume, is part of your training engagement and that kind of stuff. So my, my question is, like, what, what ultimately steers training? Uh, we talked about uh, revamping the police force and making modifications to improving upon policing in Columbia for a while now. So my question is, what informs what's training? I mean, like, like, not just how you train, but what you train on. So outside of the scope of this, well, we have a training and recruiting unit, which Chief Jones has, um, you know, went through a process to place Lieutenant Hester in there, and he play, made that placement based on his trust on uh, Lieutenant Hester's desire and commitment to training and staying up on current practices. We also have Kalia as a guide for us on what we need to train on and, and add to our training schedule to make sure that we're meeting those standards. And I know personally that Lieutenant Hester meets often with Chief Jones to discuss their philosophies. Um, obviously, we have a very fluid, changing environment right now uh, with everything that's going on in the world. So um, I am also part of a group um, that we meet with the Internal Affairs uh, supervisor. Uh, I represent CALEA and accreditation and policies and Lieutenant Hester is a part of that as well uh, from the training and recruiting side. So we meet on a regular basis and we discuss what we think the needs are as they develop, as they change, as they um, evolve and then we, uh, you know, we address them as needed. We keep the chief informed and, and we go forward. So Does that answer your question? Well let me 
add to that. So, but by state law, there are things that we have to fulfill every year. You know, we have our state law requirements for post, so we'll meet those. And then training and recruiting will meet with policy development and internal affairs. So we'll look at trends that internal affairs is seeing and say, okay, this squad's using force at a disproportionate rate to everybody else in the department. So then training and policy will come up with, okay, do we need to manage this by policy? Is it something that we need to train better? Um, as a matter of fact, we had a conversation that you brought up in a different meeting about training so that we're more physically capable to use force as opposed to using impact weapons or other types of devices. Um, so they're having conversations based on not just our internal review, which I think is important, but also having some community input where people bring up points and we go, yeah, we probably need to look at that. So to say it's one area, um, I can't point to one. It's pretty, there's a pretty broad pool of places that we pull from when we decide where the training is going to come from. Some of it's mandated, some of it's not. Some of it's just trying to get in front of issues that we're having or we see coming. I, I think what we're ultimately looking for is like, um, again, transparency we can peek on on the process. And I realize that that's not something you can document everything you do. But if you have like um, groups that are meeting on a regular basis to kind of fine tune this process, are minutes from those re meetings or any kind of report generated that we can look at that would say, they're, this is what you've taken under liberation, what you haven't? They're not formal meetings like that. Uh -huh. um, we might be able to put some group together similar to this to look at what that is. I mean, Hester runs it, and you know how Hester operates, so um, I can look at it, see? I mean, I mean ra rather than trying to, like, be on the outside looking in through records requests and everything else, like, if you had a process in place, I would just like to know what it, what it was or how well, we can get more tuned into and it. And it's not exactly what you're talking about, but there has been a lot of discussion about using community relationships, community members to provide the training, because there's a wide swath of experience and training in this community especially when we especially when we talk about mental health and those types of things um, so we'll have the goal is to have community members helping with the training but also having them participate just so that there's a level of transparency so if someone wants to sit into the training we're gonna have to limit that right um, just for capacity especially right now um, but it's something we're open to I mean they're really there is very little that we would not share with the public as far as tactics are concerned. Um, but there is some of that. And I, you know me, and you know me for a while, I'll tell you that we're not going to share that and why. But there's just so little of that that having people involved in the training is, it's a fair step. So we've, we've already had those discussions moving that way. Appreciate it. Hi, I'm sure we're sort of derailing a little bit, but um, on top of his question, I keep hearing the word training, 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 but I'm not hearing enough re-educating and educating. What is the police force doing as far as that's concerned? Because I'm seeing little things like not knowing what SAGE is and almost causing uh, a confrontation that could have led to like a mob mentality. Like, what, what kind of stuff are we doing to make the police force more educated beyond just, like, what they learn from high school or, or anything like that? You know, learning about mental health is, issues on, like, Psychology 101 um, and, you know, just learning about the basic um, spirituality practices that are outside, like, stuff that you see normally in the community that I'm seeing the community no more than the police officers. So when we're writing policies and things like that, I'm, I'm just not seeing anything that has to do with re-education, especially since we have like universities and a couple colleges around. I'm curious as to what, got, what, what are you guys doing about that, since you're talking about recruitment and things like that. And we, are, we are limited in what we have the capacity to do. And we use the words education and training synonymously. We use the word training because we have a training and recruitment unit. Um, 
but there's a level of education that comes with this job. I will tell you that the prior administration reduced that and we're looking at raising it back. I don't know if we will or we won't, uh, but I don't have a good answer for you. So my suggestion as a community member is that one, we need to stop using training and education synonymously because training seems to be physical and learning how to deescalate. Well, education is more about learning about um, you know, racism, learning about um, the in and outs of, of that, and um, just learning about, um, you know, just, just different things about the aspect of, of a community. Um, I'm also kind of discouraged to hear that um, that has decreased because I feel like that would help tremendously um, building that, that gap that is between the community and the police. Um, as a whole, because there is this gap. Um, so, I mean, how, what, what can we as the community do to help that if the police isn't capable of doing that? Because I'm not satisfied with that we may or we may not re-educate. Well, I did not say that, and okay. I, I disagree with a couple of your points, but okay. um, our training is not only physical. I mean, we do things like CIT training, which are there's a lot of education in that itself. It's a 40 hour course. Um, and that's just one example. Um, so I appreciate, and, and I'm not discounting your perspective at all. I just disagree with you. Um, I don't like lowering an education requirement because I'm not okay with hiring people into a position that are not qualified. And it's much easier for me to find someone who is well-rounded, educated, and qualified to do this job when they've been exposed um, to more education in a formal setting. That's my opinion. Not everybody shares that opinion. Um, I, I think we also have to recognize that when we expand um, entry requirements and um, we require more of people to apply. It's already difficult to get people to apply to this job. That's going to require more money, um, better benefits. I mean, the things that draw people into a profession that isn't um, the easiest profession to work. I mean, they work all hours. They work in the worst conditions, holidays. Um, when people are shooting at each other, we go toward it instead of away from it. And that gets lost in this conversation when we talk about how we need more education, we need higher qualifications. There's a there's an expense that comes with that, and we have to rec. And trust me, if I could just wave a wand and have the money to do that, um, I would have done it years ago. Um, so but as a community, we need to look at that and understand that. So then, what can we do to uh, shift things around? What's something we can? What's a stone? that we can roll to get this rolling because I think it's it's what we're doing is not working and I agree that the police has a lot on their shoulders a lot of things that they probably don't need to deal with and maybe we need to think about redistributing things but I still feel like education is very important you see other countries they require at least two to four years of training um, before they become police officers and we do three to nine months, depending. Is that correct? You know, it just seems like it's a lot to cram for the job that seems to be what you guys are required of. And it's just something to think about and something maybe we need to strive to move forward. And I know this won't happen tomorrow or in a, in a couple of years, but I think it's something maybe we need to start moving towards because what we're doing is not working. And I, I really want to see you guys thrive, but I don't see that happening. I'm seeing this gap and it's not being bridged at all. And I think education is just one of the many things. And if that means we need to redistribute things to get that, then that's probably what we should start doing. And, and you and I can have that broader conversation. I'll give you my card. It has my phone number on it. We can talk another time. Mm -hmm. um, a little out of the scope of our policies tonight but I, I do agree that education is important um, 
I'm one of the people who continued my education while I worked as a police officer, and we have a lot that do that, but it's not required. So we can talk about that another time. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Absolutely. How are you? How are you? Um, I got just two things, and I'm going to start off with a very, very positive thing. Um, during the protests, when there were lots of protests every day in the city of Columbia, I didn't personally participate in them for a reason. I watched and observed, and what I saw was effort and, and success. I thought that the Columbia Police Department did a really good job. I really did, and I watched a few of the protest movements um, down at the police station and out in the community, and the officers did good, and I had never seen that before. In the communication, uh, the, the protections, everything that they did um, was on point, and at the same time, they were alert and well prepared for whatever came up. So I want to say that and get that out of the way. My compliments. Uh, saw a couple of the officers, Lieutenant Hester, uh, just let them know they get kudos from me. Okay? Also, now, I have um, another uh, concern, uh, and I know that you're working on it because you've told us that before the issue of transparency. That is really, really going to be key. But when we talk about transparency, I wish that we would talk about uh, uh, the institution of policing and being transparent there, because there's two kinds of transparency, one that goes out to the public and the other that stays within. In other words, and, and the question, I mean, so I wish that we can get that. I mean, I know you're trying. Can you I give me an that. example of what you're talking about, Al? About being transparency is allowing things to be out front. For example, um, one of the answers that I always get when I ask about the institution of, um, like, internal affairs, um, the institution of police unions, the institution of... Um, of uh, what is it called, the um, Federation of Police, or what is it called? Fraternal Order of Fraternal Police. Fraternal Order of Police. I, I really don't ex I really don't like those answers about we have nothing to do with them, simply because in my mind, and this is just me, I think that I don't understand why police have so many protections unions, fraternal orders, um, um, fraternal orders of police, internal affairs, um, citizens review board. And I, the reason I am suspicious is because any time an institution that does some sort of an investigation comes back into with 90, 95, 99 percent in favor of the institutions that they are in favor of, I just have a suspicions of that. And to say that we don't have any control of those, if you don't have any control, well, denounce. And I know that there is an issue there. And, Federal and, and law. Me, I, yeah. I know, I yeah. know, I yeah. know. But still, we have to figure out a way going forward to, because if you're working on an image, those images give you heck in the community, sure. okay? And the other thing, too, is that um, um, if, well, I don't know, if you want to get a better image, I think that that's a start, how to figure out a way to say that the, when you, I, I guess when you look at the history of those organizations, they were put there for a particular reason, and why. The, the last thing I'm going to say, and I'll set down, because you probably heard some of this from me before, is that, um, um, uh, what was it now? Um, 
I, I think I've forgotten. But anyway, that's enough for now. But anyway, um, I, I, I want to end with saying this. What I saw, I like. And I think that I saw a difference in our department here in Columbia. And um, I would just like for us to continue thinking forward and get, and because, and this is really important, racism in institution is not the individual person. I belong to Minority Men's Network, but then that, you, it's be hard for you to say that I'm a racist, but you can look at the network and say it's, the institution is racist. So when we make policies and when we do things, we have to go deeper than just rooting out the bad ones, because that's a difficult thing to do. It's hard to get rid of a police officer. But what we, what I look at is the whole institution of policing. I look at the whole institution of fraternal order police. And when I think about Columbia, Missouri, and Missouri as a whole, we have a legislator that says that anybody can go buy a gun. And yet we say, yes, we had a lobbyist. Oh, well, please give me a break. We lost that battle. And if everybody has a gun, well then what the heck are you doing? What the heck are you for? And we just saw that well, play I out. I hope I reduce gun violence and don't cause people. Yes, but who do, you know yeah. what? If, I'm just you teasing know, you out. I know, I know, I know. And, and I'm, I'm just saying that. But when, when, when everybody has a gun, man, it doesn't work. Yeah. It does not work. I mean, who do you go after? Uh, the thing in, in, up in Wisconsin is simply amazing. And you saw it. We saw it. Everybody, the whole world has seen it. A guy walking. To, I mean, you can do that right here, too, from what I understand. But the point is, is that that's one of the area that we need to really put forth a fight in to get our lawmakers to understand in order for you to do your job. You can't have me and you and you and you walking around carrying a gun. You know, and there's been a lot of incidents where African Americans trying to do the right thing with concealed and carries have been blown away. So anyway, uh, again, um, I, I do see the effort and I just wanna say thanks to you and, and, and the Columbia Police Department, okay? Just out of curiosity, since we had the conversation about training versus education, mm -hmm. when we went to Memphis, would you have classified that as training or education? Actually, I would have classified that as training and education, simply because I saw something else in the police department. I seen officers who just really broke down. I saw officers who were educated. And I saw a Columbia resident that thought they knew something about civil rights, and they didn't. And what I saw, since you asked that question to everybody, when we visited the Civil Rights Museum, what I saw there, educational, very educational, because it gives us a look at the history. And that may be one of the reasons why you guys did such a good job with the protest, protecting the people from accidents, from, I mean, random violence, and, and we had little to no violence. And that's a remarkable job. But the Civil Rights Museum was, um, it was very educational for me also. And what was happening Back then, I see the same things happening now. And you heard that, what I said when we were there. Some of the same things. That's why these kinds of things cannot be just approved and put on the shelf. They have to be reviewed every, well, I almost said every day, but who, who has the time, right? But they have to be reviewed often, and they have to be, there has to be a, a, a forward thinking look at this and under, with the understanding that racism is not the individual, it's the institution. And some of the institution, like the institution of governing in Columbia, Missouri, go back and look at it. It's exciting, it's interesting. 
So again, uh, thanks, Matt. I really appreciate it. Good to see you. It's All been right, a while. Thanks. Thank you. <clears> hey, <throat> okay. anybody else on? Go ahead, sir. actually kind of weird standing on this side and you guys are over there. Um, I'm Travis For Pringle. me too. <laughs> I'm on the Citizens Police Review Board. Um, I just have a few questions about some of the subsections of 208. They're really just clarification questions. Uh, first one I was looking at was 2085D. And I kind of wanted to, can you give me a, a little bit more explanation of, of what, because I'm reading this I'm seeing so it's one hour per year or just what, what exactly is this training that's received? It says every peace officer with the authority to enforce motor vehicle or traffic laws is required by law to obtain at least three hours of bias-based or bias-free and or racial profiling training per three-year report, reporting period. In order to meet this requirement, in-service racial profiling Training courses must be pre-approved by post or must be delivered by an approved provider. So you, that is a minimum requirement. We go, we do go over that. Beyond that, yeah. Okay, that, that was just what stood out to me. So I'm like, I thought like one hour a year didn't seem like that would be. Anybody participating in state grants is going to be required to do three hours of racial profiling. I think it's a horrible name because it's called racial profiling. Anyway. Yeah, um, but that is a minimum requirement through the state. But we do we've done building inclusive communities. We've done um, trying to think of all the names of the trainings we've done. Fair and impartial policing. Um, we've done co customer service training that touched on some of this because um, it's all intertwined. Um, it's it's a minimum requirement. Okay, yeah, just I wanted to make sure that we do go, just seemed like one hour a year was not. Yeah, and, and I think that, and to her point, I think it will be, it would be good to have more interaction about what we're actually training, because I think when people see what we're actually training, they're going to go, oh, okay. I, I think it will be enlightening for a lot of people to realize how much we actually train um, and educate. But... There's a lot of that that goes on that is beyond a minimum requirement, but we also, a lot of this is regulated to the minimum requirement because there's funding issues, there's time issues, there's staffing issues with getting people to training. So we always aim much higher than that, but we have to make sure that we meet the minimum. Okay, because I figure we, we have Don Love coming in in October, so. I I think he'd probably be able to give a good rundown too of right. what goes on with the traffic stops and everything. I think the next one I had a question about uh, 208.6C. Yeah, the defensive tactics. Could you give me more of a rundown of what that entails? Sure. I mean, defensive tactics gets into. Um, the physical hands-on portion of our law enforcement training. Uh, takedown moves, um, that kind of thing. Ground fighting, I mean, it, it, it varies from strikes to... Um, and it, it goes over the appropriate uses of forces. Um, people, you hear people talk a lot about a force continuum. A force continuum yeah. is a training tool. So they'll go over a force continuum in the educational environment so that officers can mentally prepare of where to start um, in that continuum, know where they're at, what's appropriate. Um, but we train de-escalation, we train um, positioning, we train all of those are part of defensive tactics. It's not just how do I wrestle somebody. It's all-encompassing as far as what use of force is like officers understand the concept I think most people understand the concept they just don't articulate it but when we show up in a uniform that is a level of force 
And we talk about that. When we give a verbal command, that is a level of force. When we tell somebody to do something and they don't do it and we put their hand, our hand on their shoulder, that is a level of force. And we talk about that as part of our defensive tactics training. But um, Also an opportunity, uh, it's written into our policies, it meets CLIA standards that any time we do training such as defensive tactics or also includes use of impact weapons, batons, but they all involve a uh, review of our use of force response to resistance policies. It's part of it. So um, the repetition you were talking about, you know, there are core areas of our policy that, uh, you know, they carry high, high liability. And we try to make that more than just a once a year exposure to it. Okay, so that's good to hear they are go hand in hand. And just because I feel like I have to ask it, I mean, we don't have chokehold in our defensive tactics training at all. No, they're prohibited completely unless it's deadly force. And I can talk to that if people have questions, but it's, when we talk about deadly force, we are talking about a police officer making a decision to use, intentionally making a decision to use force that is likely to cause death or serious physical injury. It's not, hey, I'm going to use this hoping that I have a certain outcome. The outcome is death or serious physical injury. And I've been a cop for 23 years, and I have been in that position very few times. Um, but I also, we don't choke holds um, or vascular neck restraint holds, which are two different things. People use them synonymously. Um, one cuts off the airway, the other cuts off blood flow to the brain. And a chokehold, truly cutting off someone's airway, is considered deadly force in almost every jurisdiction. Um, the lateral vascular neck restraint is not considered deadly fo force in most jurisdictions. Um, but we have banned all of it altogether. And part of the reasoning for that is that it is even a lateral vascular neck restraint, restraint, not a chokehold, um, is considered um, it, or was used so infrequently that we didn't train enough, we didn't apply it in a way that we felt like we were applying it correctly. It was too easy to mess it up. And if you mess up something like that, it becomes deadly force. So we just, unless you're planning to use, or planning, if you're reacting to something and you are using deadly force intentionally, it's not used, but I would expect someone to pick up a brick if they had to, if it was that bad. So to regulate it any further than that would just, it would be placating people in my mind because deadly force is exactly that. Whatever you use as the vehicle to get there is irrelevant at that point. You have made a decision to use that type of force and you have to live with, and someone else has to live or die by your decision. And it has to be that serious. So we don't use chokeholds or neck restraints. They are completely banned by us unless we are applying deadly force. And we would do that with pencil. I mean, it just, it's really that simple for us. I, I appreciate that people are demonstrating about it because I think that attention needs to be drawn to it. People do not train in those techniques enough to use them unless they're deadly force in my opinion but the, even the prior administration recognized that and that's been a policy for us for seven eight years at least yeah there's a specific section in the in policy 300 our use of force policy that talks about nothing in the policy uh, requires us to to uh, stay with only the tools on our belt that if we're in that situation where um, we are fighting for our life. We expect you to use whatever means you have available to stop the threat. Yeah, um, we went in length talking about that our last meeting about yeah. deadly and, force and, and what it entails and what it means and how you decide that. It's, yeah, and, and that could be a fight for your life. It could be also involve a fight to save someone else's life. And at that time, you know, you, you have to use, depending on the circumstances, what's available to you. And I think our policy recognizes that. I can give you an example of when a chokehold, a brick, would have been appropriate. On Park Avenue, we had 
a lady called 911. She said that someone was stabbing her and killing her. Um, officers arrived. They were outside the door. It was public housing. Public housing doors are very, very strong. They're reinforced steel doors. Um, they could hear her fighting for her life inside, begging the cops to come in. The cops were able to knock the door down, and when they got inside, there was a male suspect on top of her cutting her throat with a box cutter. If they would have fired a weapon, they ran a significant risk of shooting her. They couldn't tase her, tase him because of the environment. And if the only thing that they had was to go choke that guy, even if they choked him to death, I would have been okay with that. And I think most people would. But we have to recognize that if we're using something in a circumstance like that, the decision is intentional. I am going to kill him or I really run the risk that that's going to happen. That's an example where had a police officer come to me when a chokehold was banned and said, I choked that guy, I would have said, thanks for saving her life. I think the, the next one I had had to do with 208.11. Uh, it's had to do with your, your civilian staff training. And really just, I was curious, have you, I, I think a few members of the board have attended one of those um, just to kind of like witness it. But I was curious about just, especially when it comes to D, if the force has thought about like maybe actually doing that training for the board, like letting us, teaching us more about CALEA, the Citizens Police Review Board. The CALEA familiarization training? Yeah, what you have for your civilian staff. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't know um, exactly what the training and recruiting unit has come up with for their training. Um, I believe I I visited you all. Yeah, no, I've, I've got a good handle. I'll bet. Just I would be happy to, to do so um, again. Yeah. Or um, we could, I could get in touch with uh, Andre down at the training and recruiting unit to find out what kind of, uh, CLIA had a video um, that they produced that was, you know, obviously it covers all aspects of CLIA and how it benefits the police department and the community. Um, yeah, but I can look in, in, into that for you. I would love that, yeah. We have three new members now and it's just, when you t when, once we get start getting deep into acronyms, it's, Sure. Hard, hard for them to keep up and anything you guys can do to like I, I think that would be a really smart thing to keep the board aware of, of just as members come and go just what Kalia is and how the standardization process works sure well uh, I'll, you tell me what you think you would find more uh, beneficial me coming to one of your meetings and and answering any questions you might have and and kind of lay it out for you it might be most appropriate to have the board send an email yes I'm going to talk to them about it myself yeah. you, it, it, we'll, work well, yeah. we'll work that out. We'll work that out. And 208.13. This is just a kind of one, just to know what an example of an outside training that officers take part in. Is, is there one that officers seem to be favorable to, to an outside training, or is it just? Really based on need. Yeah. We have drone pilots. We sent those folks to Illinois. Um, Forensic evidence used to be all uh, sent out. We do that in-house now. Blood spatter experts, um, ballistics experts. You, I mean, there's so many areas of expertise, especially when we get into evidence collection and gathering. Um, De-escalation, verbal judo. I, there are so many topics, and there are so many vendors that put those on. So. And are the individual officers kind of encouraged to like look out for stuff that picks their interest and be like, hey, come to us? So, and you know this as a board member, but the others don't. When I first came in, and I'm not, I was naive and thought I could get it done in a couple of weeks, but I've been interviewing every employee. And there are two parts to the interview. What's going well? What's not going, not going well? What do I need to fix? What's broken? And then the other part of that is where do you want to be? Like, there are so many different disciplines in policing. What is it that you want to do, and what training do you need to get there? And we try to focus training dollars because they're limited on where those interests lie um, and whether or not it's going to benefit the police department. So 
if we have someone who wants to go do tactical basket weaving, we're probably not going to send them to that training, but um, that doesn't exist that I know of. But um, we, we try to be mindful of where they want to go because we do want that level of career development with them. And do they still usually have to tie into something from the base curriculum that the, that the forest teaches? Or is there a wiggle room for them to be like, hey, we don't really touch about, like, I guess when the drones first came up, do we have officers going to drone school before we bought the drone or no but we did have a selection process before we had a drone okay or at least anticipated the process and wrote what we expected from them so that we could get that moving but um, there are just so many disciplines. For, I think a good example would be uh, along the the lines of uh, what chief was talking about uh, lining out your career path Say you have a, a patrol officer who has a desire to be a detective someday and maybe even wants to specialize in something like investigating sexual assaults or child abuse. They could seek out training away from here. Uh, schools that talk about forensic interviewing is a big thing uh, and a skill that um, you really need to get the specialized training and, and stuff like that. That's an example that comes to mind. And my last question for 208. It's 208-16-6, the field training program guide. Yep. I was just, is that, I think I may have talked to Sergeant Alpers about this back in, in January or February before everything happened. Is that guide accessible to the public? I don't think it is. Is or isn't. Yeah. I'm not afraid to make it accessible to the public. Okay, but I, we, we can request a copy of that if we want to. So I think I've been the prizes on, there. I think I've been talking to Sergeant Elbers about. I want to. I just want to read it one day, and I think that was we talked about it right before everything. All right, I'll send you an email, Chief. That's all I got for this policy. So. All right. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. I'll work on it. I, I'm not sure where they're at with it, but let me look into it and see. Tony, will you make a note of that for me? Thanks. All right. Going once, going twice. Close that one out. Okay, next one is policy 326. Um, this is in the current version called our uh, elder abuse policy. Um, Lexa Pohl, who we originally uh, got our policy manual from, came, in out, came out with an update to this. So I took that opportunity to go ahead and uh, go through their updates, implement them into this policy, and also do a review of the state law as well at the same time. Um, and as a result, several changes were made to this. Um, for one, the title was changed to adult abuse to more align with what the state statute was in the, the revised, revised statutes of Missouri. Um, our policy from 14 was just out of date. Um, we had a hotline number that we're supposed to call when we come across incidents. Uh, they now have implemented um, an online uh, entry method for um, times when the uh, the hotline is not manned so that needed to be updated um, updating of some definitions yeah that was basically the the changes to this did anybody have any questions about this policy sure And I may have missed it just when I was perusing the, the policy, but this is kind of like just an overall question about the policy as a whole. Do, do we, does CBD have any actual direct liaison with DHSS? Or I guess we've talked before about when, especially when it comes to youth, usually there's a social worker that the 
police try to call as soon as possible to get on scene and stuff. Is there anything similar to that for the uh, adult abuse? So we have someone, and Bob can talk more about, he was a domestic violence investigator for a while um, and has some pretty significant ties to that world as far as education and training and legislation and all that. So I'll, I will be brief. But we do have someone who works as an advocate in our office, um, part-time. she back? Our I, dove I, advocate? I believe so. Um, who was out for COVID for a little while, but she's back. And then the prosecutor's office has people that follow up on the back end. Um, we do a lot of, or have had a lot of training even in the academy for domestic violence. Um, but that is something that has evolved over the years and I, I don't know that there's any one stop shop for um, having an advocacy, advocacy group that would come out other than a social worker and you already know the background with our CMHL or community mental health liaison who's a social worker that will come out for some things and do some case management for some um, but we don't have anything like that on the mental health side that is directly related to the domestic violence. Is that what you're asking? Well, my focus was even, was even more on just the, the elder abuse specifically, just if we have anything in the way with that, because I, I know this doesn't really come up before our board much right. at all. We generally call it division of aging directly. Okay. Um, and we'll hotline it, and they'll, they'll send resources if we hotline it. Um, and I would have their own investigators also. I would expect, uh, kind of like with child abuse, a lot of times the police officer is not the one who's discovering it. Uh, most times we're getting called by Children's Division to come out and assist them with an investigation they're already involved in. So similar, similarly with um, the adults or the elders uh, in, in this policy, that could be possible as well, that they're already aware of a situation and they're asking us to come assist them in the, in the investigation. That's another way to, probably more often than us stumbling across it. Right. You know what I mean? So there's a couple different avenues. You have the domestic abuse side of that and the elder abuse side of that. And there are sometimes that those are gonna intersect because they're living in a home together. They have a domestic relationship. So we're going to come across it as domestic violence. Division of Aging is going to come across it through a complaint, like through a hotline or something, and we may intersect there. So there's no one answer to it. Okay, but there is a there process are resources. to get the yeah. agencies involved. Sure. Okay. That was all I had. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? On to policy 358. This one deals with major incident notifications. Uh, this policy, uh, the structure of the police department has changed a little bit over the past couple of years. Um, we no longer have a deputy chief, so uh, we need to revise to remove any mention of the deputy chief from the policy. Um, also added language to the policy that allows for major incidents uh, notification to the chief of police or bureau commanders to be made by phone or text message and for those incidents that require immediate no or th that's for immediate notification but also allowed for the use of email for incidents that were um, that, that could wait till a later time and weren't so urgent um, yeah so basically those were the changes to this policy. Also, whenever you have a change of administration, we have what's called a, a notification list that our supervisors use um, as a guide. Anytime something major happens, they can refer to the list and it will direct them on who all needs to be notified. Um, so chief 
and the patrol commander, uh, our criminal investigations division uh, supervisors, um, and our traffic uh, supervisor had an opportunity to go through that list and determine exactly what they wanted to be notified and when and, and by what means. So that's, those were the updates made to this policy. Did anybody have any questions on this? That just tells you when I get woken up. Yeah. Listing out all the, the major incidents that would require a, a notification in some shape or form to the chief of police. And I've started, as uh, I'm revising the policies, you'll notice that anytime there's a parenthesis next to the section title, this is the CALEA standard that is covered by that section or partially covered. Questions? All right. Next is policy 360, death investigations. Uh, this is something that unfortunately we work um, a lot of on a daily basis. Um, our policy hadn't um, received a revision since 2014, so I asked the subject matter experts in the department to review this policy to make sure that everything was still up to date and accurate. And we had a suggestion from one of our uh, crime scene technicians um, to make uh, a policy note that the primary report for any death investigation in which a designated assistant of the medical examiner's office responds to the scene shall be routed to the criminal investigation division for further review. Sounds to me like it was just a housekeeping uh, matter to make sure that reports were getting routed to them and not falling through the cracks. So literally that's the only change other than there, if anything else is a formatting issue. Anybody have any questions about this policy? Excellent. Three eighty two is our service animals policy. Um, we had a policy on this. This is one of those things that uh, is pretty common these days. A lot of people have service animals, and the um, how you interact with service animals is is very important. There's a uh, through revising this policy I learned a lot <laughs> there's federal regulations on it there's state law nothing completely mirrors the others there's different definitions so this policy needed to be updated to um, account for ooh, pardon me uh, for new changes for instance like a horse a horse can as defined by the uh, federal regulations can be considered a service animal. Um, and as far as law enforcement is concerned, there are certain etic etiquette that we have to follow and what we are allowed to ask of someone if we are called, say, to a business who is having a dispute with someone wanting to bring in a service animal. There are limitations to what we can ask. We are only allowed to ask if that person has a uh, disability requiring the use of a service animal and if they say yes, then we're only allowed to ask what specific task is that service animal trained to do. And if they answer yes to both of those, we, th there are no further questions to be asked. Um, so anyway, this is one of those things that um, we needed to make sure that we hit very specific um, mandates to our department that were previously established. So I went back through the policy to make sure um, that we covered all the bases. And I think we've got it up to speed now in a, in a platform that the officers can understand. Did anybody have any questions about this policy? It would be nice, I think, for standardization if everything from the federal to the state and everything mixed and was uh, was standardized. But
<laughs> okay, so you're kind of a subject matter expert. <laughs> Did you, uh, 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 and you're not asking to stand up there, so <laughs> it, it meets your seal of approval? Good. All right. Well, I won't, I won't uh, go for any more than going once, twice. Thank you very much. 408 is the next one. And this is uh, our special weapons and tactics policy. I handed this off to our SWAT commander and asked him to please review this in its entirety to, to make sure that it was up to date and accurate. Um, I had to put hands on it for one reason specifically. There's a CLIA standard that mandates that our crisis negotiation team and our SWAT team, which are together but separate entities, um, a requirement that they trained together in a scenario-based training at least once a year. And that is something that we have done historically forever, as long as I've been here, there has been that kind of training together, but it just simply wasn't mandated in our policy to do so. So that was my reason for wanting to touch this also um, it needed a review to make sure it was fresh. Lance Bollinger went through it, uh, beefed it up, and uh, that's about as much as I can speak to it. But it meets his standards and I trust the man. Questions on that policy? Four twelve is our hazardous material uh, response policy. Um, I looked at this one as well uh, because of clear requirements. And one thing we were missing uh, from this was pretty simple: was a um, awareness level training. Um, as I went through this, uh, our old policy was fairly vague and short on it. Um, I added a lot of sections, and, and I'm not too proud to say uh, when we do policy work, there are other agencies out there, and I look at a lot of policies from other agencies and, and find what fits our, uh, our needs and, and put something together that makes sense for us, for Columbia. So there was a lot of information in here that our policy was lacking, but other departments had. I liked it, I think. It, it's good information to have. Um, so anyway, that's all the additions that you see here in red. Um, the big thing on hazardous material incidents, it's one of those things that most of the time the fire department's going to be called to this um, in addition to us. Um, you know, we used to have the, the thumb rule on a hazardous material. If, if you looked at the scene and you couldn't cover it up with your thumb, you're too close. That's, you know, that's a joke. But um, the big thing about this and what this awareness level training is going to include is the use of the hazard material, hazardous material guidebook, which is now um, in an electronic form. We used to, back when I started 20 years ago, we kept them, uh, we had a book we kept in our trunk. Empty in the academy. Yeah. Now it's online and um, have access to it through our car computers. So the big thing there is being able to identify things through placards and knowing kind of whether we need to evacuate an area and to what extent. So that's basically the changes made to this policy. Yes, sir. I'm not just so clear on, are, there, are you talking about two separate departments, hazardous waste and fire? or is the hazard of waste team a part of the fire department? No, I, w this policy covers, say a, a tanker truck overturned on I-70. Mm -hmm. So we've got a traffic crash, okay? We're going to be dispatched to that as law enforcement to handle the crash. Um, it may or may not come out, depending on who's reporting it, as a hazardous materials incident. So. We want to prepare our officers when they arrive on scene to one, recognize, hey, okay, this is a specific type of, of um, 
trailer that this semi is hauling, identify it as a something that could potentially hold hazardous materials. The next step is to be able to identify what kind of material it is by a placard. And then obviously we need to get on the radio and, and notify dispatch that we need fire who's more, um, they are trained to handle these. And I'm sure fire department probably has a subsection if it truly is something like that, they would have a subsection of their department that's broken down in the- They have all their own protocols for hazardous, yeah, hazardous This materials. is just our response to it. Oh, okay. Right. Good question. Hazmat's a good reason to call a fireman. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's why they only require us to provide awareness level training is because it's that specialized. It goes beyond our scope. Any other questions about hazardous materials? What's your question? I'm sorry. Just to make sure that the department still has enough people. It, it has absolutely affected the overall supply. We're okay for right now. That is a daily struggle. You know, we're still in, even though it's months long, we're still in the acute phases of this, so getting PPE is very difficult. Um, and it, I do think that it has got us in the mindset to better prepare for the next event. Um, I feel like we were we were somewhat prepared, but uh, nobody could have anticipated this. So we will definitely take some of our federal funding and put that toward acquiring PPE for whatever comes next. Okay, this next policy, um, this is a brand new one. So this is a proposed draft and is currently a special order uh, that is in effect uh, by order of the chief of police. Uh, but part of the process is to make this formalized and, and go through the city manager and adopt it into our policy manual. Um, I think over the years, I don't know what brought this about, but over the years, um, suspicious fires or fire investigation has changed hands on who's actually covering, you know, the actual investigation of it. Um, so I think someone saw a need to have a, a formal agreement and this agreement was adopted on February 13th of 2020. Um, I made this into a policy that quite simply says that the Columbia Police Department will assist the Columbia Fire Department when requested with the investigation of suspicious fires as explained in the proposed CFD CPD suspicious fire interdepartmental agreement dated 213 of 2020. And literally what follows is the exact agreement verbatim. Um, so, I don't feel comfortable making changes to this because this is what was agreed and signed and kind of a standalone document, but it is something that is accessible to our personnel should they need to find it. Any questions there? It wasn't. You, we have people trained in fire investigations, and obviously the fire department has people that are very well trained in fire investigations. Um, this actually came about, I won't talk about the particular case because I'm not sure if it's completely adjudicated, but we had an arson um, where the fire department brought out the fire marshals, and there was a lot of evidence to be collected, um, and even the identification process of evidence were just more well equipped to deal with that. Um, so we were, there was no process by which we would collect, identify and collect evidence for them um, and for them to work as a different agency with us. So we thought it would be best to codify that in agreement, say how we would process evidence, how our investigators would work together uh, just so that there was a more concrete method 
it was working okay. We just, there were some things that almost got missed in that investigation and they wanted to make sure that we were doing it better next time. That's the goal here in all of this is to be better tomorrow than we are today. And uh, they saw the need and that's what this is. <laughs> well, it helps, yeah. And the nice thing is, is that our officers can now get our policies on their cell phone. If you know, face it, there are some things you just don't deal with every day, and when you do come across it, it's like I need a refresher, and now you can get it on your phone. This is another um, new proposed policy. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the critical incident response team or our peer support program as a, an option to people coming back from military deployments or um, as a resource. So the peer support program, we have um, certain officers in the department who went through this training um, it was pretty extensive training. I think they this this was one of those that they went out of town for, um, and they came back and I asked them to develop a policy because they were the subject matter experts. So they came to me with what they had and we put it in in policy form, and this is the result. So basically, this um, provides the framework and the guidance uh, <clears throat> for officers. Excuse me to to seek out this help and also for the <clears throat> members of the team to provide it and the, pr the processes to do that. <clears throat> I need to get a drink of water. Okay. Pardon me. Go ahead. Any questions about this one? So we've had a lot of, uh, at least, in recent times, we've had a lot of conversations about mental health of police officers, um, higher suicide rates for police officers. That's become a pretty um, well-known issue in policing. Uh, and we have a lot of controls in place as far as an employee assistance program, our chaplains. Uh, but we also are finding more and more, especially with violent crime being what it is, right now that our officers are responding to traumatic events regularly, um, whether that's gun violence, car crashes, um, child death, uh, you name it, they respond to it. And we really felt like having a response team that could help identify and mitigate some of the issues that come with this kind of work were important. So. I think that this policy covers what we do really well just in the interest of transparency so that people understand what type of help people are getting or have access to when bad things happen. We good? All right. I didn't auction it off like you did, <laughs> but yeah, I think we're good. Okay. Policy 1030, this one covers our compliments, commendations, and awards for exceptional performance. And <clears throat> this one was revised in 2019, but in 2020, um, we basically made one change to this. In the past, we had an employee recognition committee that would handle um, any kind of accommodations say an officer did a good job and, and a supervisor wanted to uh, put them up for a commendation, they would fill out a form, submit it, the Employee Recognition Committee would meet on it and send it up through the chain um, of command to get approved. Um, another part of the recognition of officers is the annual um, Officer of the Year uh, award, supervisor, civilian, and uh, <clears throat> the Molly Bowden to uh, you know, to recognize officers on, on that level. That also was handled by the Employee Recognition Committee um, and the 
police foundation, which is separate from the, um, the police department, would handle and work with the department on putting together this this um, awards banquet. Um, it got confusing from time to time. People would come and go and, and leave the, uh, the foundation or my position and uh, chief wanted to make a change to that. I don't want to speak for you, but the uh, uh, wanted to make a change to that and make it more uniform and kind of take it out of the hands of us as police officers on deciding who would get these awards and remove it from us and any kind of, you know, favoritism or biases or anything like that and put it with the police foundation who is completely neutral. And I think it was a good move and, and it's consistent. So, And I think it's consistent with a community-oriented police model in which citizens are responsible for recognizing what good work is. So if we're going to say that someone is the officer of the year, it should mean something. And I think by having independent group do that evaluation, it gives more meaning to what that officer or officers are awarded. So, Quite simply, that was the, uh, the only change to content in this policy was to account for the, the um, police foundation taking over that function. Questions about that? On, on the matter of training, um, I, I kind of look at this much in the same light, not, not training, I'm sorry, but the awards programs. Um, I look at that much in the same light as your feedback sessions, your annual performance reports, whatever the equivalent is for the uh, police department. Um, along the lines of the performance reports, what, get me what's, what gets measured gets done. And so I think that's like one of the big problems, you know, that, that you know, when we keep looking for transparency, it's just like looking at what does the department value uh, the individual supervisors when they rate their trainees or um, subordinates, whatever. Um, there, there, there's a lot of stuff that kind of um, is missing from the public eye that we'd, we're, we're going to keep <coughs> digging into. With this type of program, turning it over to a third party, what we do is we divest our interest and concern to form community-oriented policing standards. Uh, like if the department is taking on steps and you're engaged with the community and we're making steps forward, who's to say that this other board, um, who they're made up of, are going to share the same values? I mean, I, 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 have, I, have, I, I hesitate to just turn carte blanche the program over to a third party without knowing who that third party is accountable to. Uh, it, for example, if CPOA was invited to come in to do it, there'd be problems because we have problems with CPOA. I mean, that's an organizational thing, but, and they don't share the same vision as policing. So how do we have um, backups for this type of process where, number one, that we can see what standards they're judging on and that the right people are there to assess that information? I think that you get into that is a ball of twine and it's a catch-22. The reason it's a catch-22 is because if you want citizen input as to what uh, what is important, then you have to give up some control. That doesn't mean I give up all control of how people are evaluated, how they're rewarded as a police department because those awards are one time recognition based on some type of performance. And uh, I can tell you that the officers who are recognized because I was told who they are and what it's for, I am comfortable as the police chief with what they're being rewarded for. But that control in my mind has to be given out to the third party for there to be citizen input. And any, you know, other people can join that board. Other people can be active in that board. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't limit everyone's ability to have input. It, well, I guess it does in a way. But it, it also gives up control for a portion of that so that officers are being recognized and have a goal to please community interest um, in their daily work. So that's one piece of it. The other piece of this is how evaluations are conducted. And actually, I thought you were going down that road when you were talking about this. Evaluations currently 
are the same evaluation citywide for every employee. So the criteria used for a sanitation worker is the same criteria that's used for a police officer. Okay? So they're rated in these different categories. And what we're in the process of doing, and we're actually almost done with the process, is looking at that um, example, the, and you've seen this document, the Community Outreach Unit Goals and Objectives, what our measurables are in that. We've taken components of that and added it to a more defined list so that when our supervisors rate those categories for human resources, they're using our own criteria. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. So we've drilled that down so that what is important from yeah, <coughs> listening tours or our interactions with other people and groups in the community, this is what's important to us is our policing in the community. These are the things that we're rating police officers on. And it's not a comprehensive list, but it is certainly better than going into teamwork and defining that in whatever subjective way we're going to do that. So those are two different types of evaluations of behaviors and ability and performance. This is just one small piece that gives, I think it's four awards annually to four different people. Um, but it had to be codified in this because we were changing the process. And it takes away favoritism because, you know, I have people who I've known for 20 years that work in the police department and everybody assumes that I'm going to give them things that I want for the new guy that I just met or the new gal that just started. You know better than that of me, but other people assume that because that's how people think. When we do it this way, I'm not choosing who did it. They get to see the nomination from a community member or a police officer or whoever that might be based on a set of criteria. And those criteria are there, and I don't know, I would assume the foundation would probably give it to you, but um, it wouldn't be anything that was objectionable to you or anybody else. It's just separate from us, and I think it has to be. We have to start moving toward getting recognition outside of our own internal process, um, at least in some ways. I, I think the visibility, again, I think with almost any organization trying to get, you know, reasonable visibility into your process is always a challenge, and I, I do respect that. Um, but yeah, going back to the um, evaluation forms, I mean, absolutely, that's been a couple of years of concerns that I brought up. Um, are, are, is there going to be a template available that we can kind of look at and see what it's being measured by? Do we have ballpark time frame, or? I have asked for the end of the month to have the preliminary okay. document to me. Um, there are going to be things that I add and take away. Bob knows this very well. That is the most patient man in the police department, by the way, because he throws stuff at me, waits on me to get it done, and then has all types of revisions because I make him bleed with ink a lot of times. But I'll probably do the same thing. In all okay. transparency, I will probably do the same thing with these because I'm going to have my own ideas. But I've asked each division commander and um, unit commander to come up with those criteria. Tony's been up with that some also. So... I need to see what that's going to look like, and then I'll have a better idea. Um, I'm hoping to have it done by the first of the year just so that we can start our new process. You know, we're already into this evaluation process, this period, but for the next period, I'd like to have it done. Now, is this all internal deliberation that we're dealing with, or is there any external input? You can't separate the two because, I mean, Chad, I'm – I'm always out talking to people and you'll see things reflected and you already have probably tonight things that are in this or that we've talked about that have come from our conversations. So you can't separate the two, um, but I'm having internal people create the lists. Um, we'll have to look at what that, what they come up with to, as to whether I'm comfortable with that or if I get more advice. I mean, there are people out in the community that I reach out to and say, hey, what do you think of this? Um, I don't know what level of outside input I'll take from that in addition to what I've already had because most of what you'll see comes from the input I've already gotten. So uh, well, I think it probably goes without saying Race Matters Friends would be interested in seeing what that looks like. So if you have the ability to share that or if it's public, just knowing where to find it would be. Right. Yeah, and it... I mean, it's not 
out there yet. And there's no secret in it. I mean, it's what we're, we're going to use to evaluate police officers, and HR would give you what criteria we use to evaluate other employees. So I don't see a problem with putting it out there. I'm not afraid to do that at all. So Certainly we appreciate that. Thank you. Hey, anybody else? All right, that brings us to our last one. Um, nothing really special here, um, just that we needed to update our policy to get it um, in line with a lot of current practices. For one, we added the uh, airport and park rangers to this policy to cover them. So what this policy is, is police um, uniform clothing regulations. I added civilian to the title. Um, like I said, we just recently um, this year added airport public safety officers under the police department as well as the park rangers. So they needed to be included in this policy. Some other changes that we've had is now we are allowed to wear external vest carriers, so the policy needed to be updated to reflect that. Um, there were some areas of CALEA standards, uh, three of them that in some way um, were touched on this. Uh, so basically some wording was added to, um, to hit the standard, nothing major or earth shattering. And if ever I'm going through these, for those that are in interested, if you want to see the standard, you just let me know and I'll, I can pull the standard up and show you exactly what it is and what it says. So, again, no secrets there. Um, another change to this was uh, one of our officers wanted uh, it included in our Class B uniforms, which is uh, what you'd probably see someone wear every day. Um, without the external vest carrier. It's less formal than our Class A uniform. Um, certain times of the year is Breast Cancer uh, Awareness Month and they wanted the ability for uniformed officers and our community service aides to wear a pink undershirt in support of that. So that was added to this. About it. Did anybody have any questions as you reviewed this policy? I'd say the external vest carrier was a huge thing for a lot of our our officers. That was a, big thing. a lot of police officers have back problems. Um, what I'm currently wearing weighs 27 pounds. Um, so you can imagine day in, day out, getting in and out of a car, um, getting up and down out of your office. Karen. Doc, sees me up on the third floor walking around with my shoes off and no duty belt on but um, these folks don't get to they don't have that luxury so um, it certainly causes some back issues and the, those external vest carriers uh, redistribute the weight of all this stuff that I carry on my belt and they distribute it all over that vest so it's been very helpful as far as um, reducing the pain that back pain that officers have That was, uh, that was number 11. We got through them all. Any questions or comments, things you want to discuss, things I can do better next meeting? I appreciate, I appreciate your interest in this. I really do. I do have more in the hopper that uh, I want to get out fairly quickly so I anticipate the next meeting will not be as long COVID had a lot to do with with this but um, anyway so keep your eye out for the next announcement I don't know exactly when it'll be but I've got several that I want to put in front of the chief for for approval thank you thank you y'all have a good night